without further ado, I really want to introduce um, Fernando to you, and you probably pronounce you're, you're probably pronouncing him better than I will. <laughs> but I had a fantastic discussion with um, him last week, and we're really excited to have him speak to us on the subject of AI, friend versus foe. It's such a topical uh, conversation right now, wouldn't you say, Fernando? Absolutely, uh, and and uh, yeah, you know the, the the questions I get this this these talks have come from all the questions I've received uh, throughout my lecture series. So as of six months ago, I was lecturing on creativity specifically on how we scale creativity, re rethink what creators are, um, mm -hmm. creative people throughout the history of time. And I can give you that postulate in a bit, if that's interesting. But essentially uh, teaching creativity as a skill to world leaders, to making hit records. But the most pressing thing is, you know, is, is the um, potential relationship um, and, and it's 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 perspective um, in relation to our value proposition as human beings uh, with yeah. AI alongside AI alongside the futures of synthetic intelligence and then the evolution of synthetic intelligence merging with organic intelligence. Definitely. I'm going to just share my screen so everybody can jump along. As me can see it, I believe we are in. Can everybody see my screen? So we are sitting in session six, um, and before he gives too much away about himself, go ahead and you can see that there's a quick poll in here. I'm curious to know, uh, there's a, a lot of things uh, that Fernando has actually done, as you can see here, um, fantastic. So, so many things to learn from you as a, a creative. Uh, what would you say um, would be the other world famous act that uh, Fernando has produced for? I'm not going to guess because I know for a second, so I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to put your answer in. Um, or there's some, I could give it away, but I won't. I won't. I'm going to give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Fernando, do you, do you want to do the reveal? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's you too. I had a chance to work with, um, with the group um, uh, years ago. And it's great music together, and um, and yeah. So it's one of we have I have a whole arsenal of of artists, uh, a list that I've that I've um, procured over time. That's amazing. So good. I have many more questions on that, but for another day. So jumping into um, AI, I thought it'd be really interesting to hear from everybody first because AI is such a big topic right now. Um, and for some people, it's a huge win. And for other people, it's actually a real threat to their existence as a content creator, as an educator, um, as a creative in general. So I'm curious to know um, from our participants, um, I wouldn't say audience because you guys are uh, you're an engaged uh, learner. So feel free to jump in here, put your response down. Um, it's interesting already actually from the responses here, isn't it, that we've got quite a number of people who are on the fence. And to be honest, I mean, I'll probably be swayed after your conversation with us, but I'm probably on the fence here as well. Um, does this surprise you at all, Fernando? No, because it's still, uh, <laughs> uh, not at all. Because like, like, unless you're on the cutting edge of uh, um, product rollout, right? So how, how, how uh, you know, let me, let me just quickly, do you want me to kind of kick this off and kind of give you some perspective uh, as far as like why this is the number, this is the number you received? Nicola, please go for it. I think yeah. So, so essentially, essentially, unless you're uh, uh, on the kind of, I guess the, the, the like the ground room floor equivalent of uh, um, plugin development for for ChatGPT, Baird, or any LM derivative or diffusion mm -hmm. model derivative. So there's two worlds, right? This right now. There's other um or, um um uh, artificial intelligence, but the, 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 pre predominantly right now it's language learning models and diffusion models. Language learning models are, are derivative of the English language, which then translates into uh, code and et cetera, the, the algorithmic code to um, give you um, output uh, to your inputs. Diffusion is based on uh, existing models that leverage more, uh, are focused more on the output of the um, experiential, such as visual, audio, uh, et cetera. So that's just a kind of a crude assessment of the two worlds. Um, that's that's the tech that's being used overall right now, um, the majority. So unless you're in developing the plugins that are rolling out using these two models, um, you would be on the fence too, right? And so when you see the rollout of this, you start to understand um, both the strengths of the of the human and the weaknesses of the human, um, the output mm -hmm. cognitively. So mm -hmm. the strength is that we can understand how to use it right now, um, but the, the the challenge is that. We don't. We still don't know how exactly it does what it does. We have an idea mathematically, mm -hmm. but we're still um, 
uh, in a sense, reverse engineering the models so that we could better understand essentially consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's really, yeah, that's really, really interesting. So I think um, let's piggyback off what people are kind of commenting on. I would be really interested because sometimes it's just nice to know what you have in the room and then we can kind of speak to some of the some of the common concerns. So guys, I'd love for you to take a moment and actually I'm going to type some of the notes that you give me. I, I would love for you guys to turn off your mics and actually feel free to volunteer stuff, um, our team as well. But also you can feel free to jump on your phone and put down your answer as well. So I want to know what concerns, if any, do you have currently about AI as it currently relates to your role as a creator? Um, so feel free to, to jump in with some answers and I'll, I'll type them out. What would you guys say? Can I jump in? Hi. Please. Um, uh, one of my concerns would be um, identity theft and um, security issues, privacy issues. Um, uh, that's something that I'm not <laughs> entirely yeah. sure is how, how uh, well that can be um, navigated. Interesting. Thank you. Let's, uh, that's good. We'll keep popcorning it. We'll get a couple more and then we'll see what other people have put on the great wall. Well, that happens. I can answer that. That's more efficient. Oh, go for it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so essentially what we're looking at is, is there's real no consensus of even terminology to use for this, right? So Will Lamb says uh, facial math, uh, a few others say um, essence, but what does that mean, right? Essentially what that means is I can borrow the term fingerprints. So all, so what people have recognized the value set of what makes us human as we're defining that, well, we can identify, well, some of the things that, that people recognize as being human is the face, uh, our sound of our voice. Um, so these, these we call, I call specifically fingerprints. So how do you um, uh, develop an intellectual property equ law equivalent to establishing what the ground floor rule is for ownership of who you are through by way of facial uh, fingerprint symmetry that's uniquely yours, um, voice signature fingerprint that's uniquely yours. But how about this one? Character fingerprint that's uniquely yours. So how do you do that, right? Because when we look at brands, we look at brand personality. When we look at celebrities, we look at celebrity personalities, right? So how do we quantify that? That's what you're heading up against an IP law. That's a challenge. We don't have the vocabulary for it. So what's going to happen is essentially it's this period of, of a renaissance or chaos, whichever seat you per sit, prefer to um, your worldview to sit by or on, and then you have um, adoption, right? And then distribution, right? So we're at the essence, the chaos, cortic renaissance space of this, of this question, right? And it's a very good question. It's a, a very, I mean, at the forefront question, yeah. So good. Any other ones, guys, that come to mind? We can just list off a couple. I'm sure there'll be more in the group board. Oh, go for it. Mine's on the, mine's on the board, but... um. Just the idea of if we're all using it to for creativity, does that not limit the creativity? Because in the creativity, what makes us, you know, different and stand out? And if we're all using one tool to gain creativity, then isn't it all coming from the same place? And that it does eliminate well, that's creativity. Yeah, let me, let me walk you through this question, um, and specifically from my, my understanding of it. So, so, so I've been teaching creativity as a skill to world leaders, arguably for the past 10 years, say arguably, because there's different tiers of leadership roles. And so I've luckily I've managed to, to, to work um, my way from the top down. Um, and so, so essentially creativity is basically the brain's ability, ability to create. And so throughout history, we use tools to create, right? And so these tools have evolved. Right, essentially, to, from the post, uh, from to the Renaissance, up until the Renaissance period, and then through the post-industrial revolution, so all four of them. Uh, so, so the tools are evolving for creativity, and yes, the human output is essentially the top tier for me, uh, philosophically, is creativity. It's the brain's ability to truly synthesize all its experiences, in, and then by using this model called um, combinatorial and cumulative innovation, which means a uh, building from the past, um, building from the past cumulative and combining those past ideas into something new, combinatorial, you end up with, with now what it's called originality, right? So, so yes, that's, that's essentially our, our, think of them as tools that are evolving. That's one world of perspective. Now, the problem with this one world of perspective is that it's derivative. So it's, re it's from regenerative data points, regenerating existing knowledge from the history of humanity that's been onloaded to uh, 
the research grounds that's called the internet and its databases. So basically, innovation is still there, um, so long as it's human human curation that's that's uh, curating, uh, overseeing this process will yield to new results. Without it, you will see, I think at this very much point, this will change, but at this point right now, you'll see regenerative ideas that are still combinatorial and still have a certain uniqueness and output, but still needs human curation to validate its output. Mm. Yeah, so we'll see. And um, we, um, we're going to tackle it a little bit later, kind of how we can future-proof ourselves as creators kind of towards the end of this discussion. But I think just addressing these concerns or a few that are highlighted to you here, Fandado, is there anything that kind of jumps out that you would want to speak to? Oh, uh, it, I, I didn't answer that question effectively. What's the need for, uh, will eliminate the need for creators? Well, I think it's the question I like to ask myself, will it eliminate, eliminate uh, the eliminate the need for humans right and so ultimately <laughs> because they're one and one but but let's revalue how we see how just follow mm. me on this tangent revalue how we see humans for a second um and rethink this right so so yeah. before um the industrial revolution we valued ourselves on wisdom and it's uh and then and then spiritual derivatives of wisdom as well right and so we have uh, formidable knowledge as Aristotelian thinkers, right? As as logic logicians, and that's we valued ourselves that way, right? Then we had an after the Renaissance period, we have an introduction of the beginnings over time of an industrial revolution, right? So this industrial revolution gave us a new value proposition. Well, now knowledge, um, uh, skill based knowledge, was very valuable, right? So so when you have skill based knowledge, then we have okay, I value myself by how successful I am as a businessman earliest early 20th century, right? How valuable I am as a toolsman, as craftsman, as all these industrial revolution derivatives. So, so, so that's how we evolved our value proposition. Now we look forward to where we are today prior to the democratization, the egalitarian at, access point to AI. We have um, ending the industrial revolution, this area of industrial revolution with um, access to knowledge as our value proposition. Right. So as we went from acquisition of knowledge, application of knowledge, to now identifying ourselves as um, uh, value through how we use this knowledge in society, right, in every endeavor of our life, that's how we value people, pretty much in the Western world, how we value uh, ourselves. Now, we're shifting to a new perspective of, um, that we have to adopt, essentially, to navigate um, and rethink our value proposition. So. There's a term I like, uh, came, I think it came out of MIT, which is called the, um, the homo sapiens, right? So it's a borrowed you know, derivative of homo sapiens, et cetera. Um, but homo sapiens is the human um, feeling essence-based um, entity. Um, and that's essentially what makes us really human, is to be able to feel right. our way through reality, right? So you're talking right. about emotions, instinct. Exactly. So, so the more the nuanced... Um, derivative of, of the prior to the Renaissance period, right? The, the sensory based uh, um, the essence of ourselves. So that's still very difficult to um, quantify or articulate, but we can we can say that um, that's one thing per se that um, synthetic intelligence still can't do. And it's going to be very difficult to do only because we technically do not understand mm. how we synthesize all these emotions, how we interpret the world through consciousness. We can't yet, yet still to this day agree upon whether consciousness is emergent from the self or it's um, um, non-behavioral deterministic, it's everywhere, right? We, we can't even decide that. We can't even agree on in the academic spaces where the most intelligent people arguably in, in the world exist, um, still can't agree on this very point. So, but there's a caveat and, and I feel more confident than ever that we can double down on what makes us human and therefore better makes it makes us as a society, more effective to use and to synthesize these tools in a way that brings humanity value. Yeah, I think it's the thing. Like we, we are, um, we get industrial revolution was very knowledge based, and you get ahead of the game by knowing more. But now, research, information is everywhere. So being able to use intuition and instinct um, and, and emotional appeal is social. That's not going to go out of existence, and actually, it, it causes our learners to become. Um, more effective because they're having to analyze and evaluate you still you don't lose those parts of um of yourself when you're creating content 
Uh, you mentioned some really interesting things when we were chatting last time where we we're demystifying kind of um, AID, uh, sorry, um, AI. I'll just pull up my screen here. And you were just mentioning that it's already in everyday life. We use lower forms of it already. You threw, you know, there are a couple of couple of ones that you put up here, the internet, the calculator, uh, the use of chatbots. Um, did you want to embellish on this at all? Yeah, it, it, um, what, this is the question is derivative of like, uh, you know, is it going to replace us, right? The existential question. And, and yeah. although this is an argument I find like very reasonable in the sense that, well, we've had tools before, um, like calculator and, and, and um, you know, obviously the inter internet, but, but we have tools throughout the history of existence that helped us evolve to um, our greater selves uh, and for the, for, for the sake of growth. But, but this, is, this one is uniquely different in that it's the first tool that rivals, if not outperforms us cognitively in many mm -hmm. ways. That's the difference. And so what this, this is an existential challenge to ours that it can outperform us for the first time in certain spaces. And it's not that it's like really, 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 really awesome right now. It's the propensity to be awesome really soon. Yeah. Like I see right now, I mean, you can type in stuff into chat GBT and it's really, really great to get you started. But as you start using it more and more, it becomes really basic language, not fresh, original stuff. So it's definitely in its um, its early form. But um, but, but the, 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 um, the actual um, timeline is really short in which it will excel. That's the, that's the argument. That's it's the, that it's it's uh, it's closer than we think. And I, I don't mean to sound um uh, you know, anyway, uh, um, apocalyptic in any into the world. <laughs> but, but I, mean, I, need, I need to distill and articulate as best as I can yeah. what, where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. As far as the challenges. Mm -hmm. I asked you the question last week, and I'd love for you to share it with these guys because um, it's very typical. Because I'm always thinking when I'm creating content or I'm teaching or whatever, and I'm leveraging content like this, I want my learners to be able to decipher whether it's content that's been created by a human or whether it's been content created by AI. Can you tell the difference? So this is essentially 10 years ago, I was uh, I had access, uh, 2011 specifically, a little bit more than 10 years ago, access to the first round of deep fake uh, clone, voice cloning. And it, was, it wasn't any different than it was today, than it is today, I should say. Uh, and so um, I, I saw this coming. So I started um, framing out what creativity really is, how to teach it, um, how to frame it out as a skill. And mm. so that's what I've been doing with, with, with the world leadership community and academic community. Mm. Thereby, uh, I, I think now more than ever, it's essential to understand your very nuanced essence that the industrial revolution has dulled, right? Our sense to feel, our sense to, to uh, sense other people, uh, um, get to know the true nature of another person by, by doing what we used to do before, right? It's, it's, um, le leveraging our senses uh, to better synth delineate between what's synthetic and what's organic. This is a skill, right? Now, I'm not saying that you'll, be, you know, with the skill that you'll, you'll be a hundred, hundred percent accuracy rate of trying to figure out whether you're something, an ad coming to you is synthetic or organic, or a person on the ad is synthetic or organic, right? It's to better train mm -hmm. what you sense your instincts telling you it's organic and synthetic without the need for a machine telling you that. Mm. So we hedge ourselves by being more human. Okay. Equally, we, we, we hedge ourselves by having the best tools to synthesize whether something is organic or synthetic. You see, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the, the, the yeah. power law of the universe is essentially polarities of negative and positive. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's also in our cultures, right. Yin and yang, um, uh, um, uh, I can go on, uh, further into that, but I'll, I'll stop myself from there. Uh, but but mm -hmm. essentially, and these polarities have been also a misnomer. It's spectrum of negative and positive, right? It's a mm -hmm. balance between understanding what is harmful, what's good. It's a spectrum of this. So that's why I say always hedge yourself. And I think uh, mm -hmm. the value for creativity um, in, uh, as a skill, instinct, intuition as a skill, is going to be one of the most value postulates that we can um, uh see uh, uh, when it comes to wisdom and what the human value is mm. yeah 
That's really interesting. I mean, to a lesser extent, we joke about it that you would never use Wikipedia as a, a, an effective research site because it's full of flaws and a whole bunch of people jumbling their, their, their stuff on there. Already we're having to teach our learners, our users, to be able to decipher what's right, what's wrong, what's fake, what's not. So this, this is definitely an elevated version of that, isn't it? So, so interesting. Wikipedia is actually uh, one of the most highly curated, most successful crowdsourcing, but it still has its deficiencies. You're right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Could you speak to, I mean, I, I put a space in here actually just for me to take notes and everybody else, I encourage you to do the same. How can we leverage it effectively? So you said that 10 years ago, you're already kind of preempting that this thing yeah. was coming. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if you wouldn't mind sharing some advice that you are sharing with creative, you know, creators, if, a few tips and best practices about how we can, you know, we've got um, L&D professionals, we've got people who are training, onboarding, uh, teaching, lecturing, all, all kinds of different fields, but how, mm-hmm. how can we leverage it effectively um, in a way that it doesn't replace us, but it actually uh, enables us to do better at our jobs. So when I get this at this type of powerful question, Nicola, I, I look to at, um, I figure out where this sits in my problem solving capabilities. Mm. For me, I to get to that point, I say, well, this is a comp- is this a complicated issue or a complexity issue? Mm. And then um, so that's my first one. And so complicated uh, problems are problems that. Uh, you know the questions to ask to solve mm-hmm. complexity are problems that you have no idea what the questions are yet so so at the beginnings of this question you do have a complicated um, scenario mm-hmm. and then i'll get to compl- the pl- complexity issue of this so the second way I, I try to solve problems is how would i give my children the tools mm-hmm. to leverage the answer wow Tell me more about that. Well, arguably the people you care about the most in the world would be the ones you've given life to. So if you're going to have a prolific answer, you want to have it in a way that can empower those ones you love the most in the world. Mm. So therefore, your answer, this, this, this secures the answers the best you can do. Mm. So for me, to answer your first tier, this is a complicated question. Leveraging AI effectively. Mm. Well, what's your goal? Mm. Mm-hmm. So if your goal is to be the best criminal in the world in any space and to do evil and to do harm to humanity, then you want to get really become really effective at prompting and diffusing your way through hacks if you want to be the most prolific at being great and good for the world then you want to get become the most prolific at generating the effective prompt that will get you to the space as well as generating the imagery and and the content that will support your argument in a very prolific way Mm -hmm. and so now if my children is going my my child my son my daughter is going to make a choice and I would first start with, do you want to do good in the world? Do you want to do evil in the world? Mm. And I hope the answer is uh, good, obviously. Yeah, hopefully. I wonder where you're going when you started out with the criminal example. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, if I go so. further, then this is, not, this is not the place, I think, to, to share the specifics of it. But let's say you can do equally, really effectively well. Mm. Do good or do evil. So, so what is your goal? My goal is to teach my child to be extraordinary good for the world mm-hmm. so in order can, to do that yeah can you give an example like a, a like a practical case study scenario where maybe you've led for it effectively in your area of expertise so in order to do that effectively right so to teach my child to answer your question also is yeah. to teach him the arts teach him humanity mm. because the press prompter right now is a philosopher meets behavioral cognitive expert. Wow. Because you must treat it like when you prompt effectively, if you look at the way some of these great uh, mm-hmm. philosophers of our generation, you know, if, if you look at how Alan Watts prompt uh, ChatGPT, right? How would uh, Hume prompt ChatGPT? Now, knowing that you have to ask it to be an expert of something to begin with or to be the 
most prolific at uh, uh, the specific niche of uh, the existential arguments of philosophy, right? Then you can use it to its fullest degree at this very point in time. Over time, that get easier. You would have to just be prompt less, less effectively. But I think over time, you'll see that the more you strengthen yourselves with the worldview of the creative um, generations throughout history of time, and then think like one, so it's not generative of what exists already online, you'll have a little bit of a hand up, a leg up, mm -hmm. right? That's what I would teach. That's what I'm teaching, actually, you know, my children and, and uh, my commu next generation community. So that's the humanities are the kind of the one of the most ultimate superpowers right now. We can shift our academic uh, disciplines across the board from um, from kindergarten to to Ivy League. Mm -hmm. Remember, we we took them out. We took them out of our education system. Public. It's very what difficult. To get. Out, sorry. Yeah, the the humanities. Um, it's very difficult. It's the first thing to go. It's always yeah. the arts. Isn't but, it? Have, yeah. So so I would swap out the, the coding schools and computer science schools for uh, humanities. So oh, basically aggressive. that's now. aggressive, but but essentially that's my point, just to make my point. That's where we're heading. It's a great example. So taking out something like history or something that's very knowledge based. No, no, taking, taking out coding. You don't yes, need to code yeah, anymore. Correct. Yeah. Coding is English. Right? It's any language. It understands every language. So so I think essentially the best thing you can do with your time is is you don't need to learn Python anymore. C plus plus it's done. Mm. Done. Right. Um, in, in other words, it's the there's there's plugins that do it way better than some of the graduates out of these universities. But then he's looking at like um, uh, like leadership development and communication skills, and character, kind of, yeah. all of these yeah. soft yeah. skills kind of focuses that we're talking about. In addition to the arts, social and learning behavior, all of those kinds of things. You're saying, oh yeah, so. That's right. So you have an egalitarian access to data points, right? So, so it oh, used good. to be that as business, you have, um, this is interesting. It's worth, I think worth sharing, at least from my opinion. That, mm -hmm. so, so we've always valued um, venture funds and its investments per se on its, you know, its data plus leadership. But yet we're going to, we're going to have access to data points um, at scale. Right? How to qualify a company, how to qualify a fund, how to qualify an investment. So we're going to need new tools to separate what's truly uh, worth investing into. And these new, new, new tools that I'm seeing, because I have access to, to um, specific communities that are working on this, um, I can see a, a focus on the character, because that's still very difficult to quantify. And it's, there's a couple, it's a couple pieces of great literature on this, but, but character is, is something that is innately human. It can be mirrored through pattern identifying, but character is what we're going to look for as far as who to invest in and what to invest in. And we're seeing these schools of thought play out in what departments the universities are developing, right? There were new departments based on, on this very topic. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. funds are being qualified on this very topic and new investments are being qualified in this very new perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really great example. Um, but maybe this is the same question from a slightly different lens, lens and then I really would love to hand the rest of the time over to um, our, our participants because it's sure. such a hot topic right now. It's all over the place. Sure. So I'm sure they've got brilliant questions too. But slightly worded in a different way, I'm curious, what do you think AI is going to look like? I know you can't predict, but if you could in five years' time, and I guess the flip off that is how can we uh, safe or future-proof ourselves? Depends where you're at and where you're looking, but for us, if I can just sum it up for the Western world, I think it's going to be, there you go. yeah. yeah, it's going to be the, um, you've seen it now. If you walk down Rodale Boulevard or any popular street on any boulevard of any major metropolitan city, you see the mm -hmm. individual on their phone just staring down and just walking, right? Like, mm -hmm. and you see um, kind of these automatons, not to degrade any way, shape, or form, but these automatons are based on a reward mechanism built by platforms that's very prolific, right? And so, um, in a sense, what this means as they're walking through and bumping into a wall is that we've we've re we've created a, a a world built on incentive structures that are misaligned with our true output as a human. So the word mechanisms you're starting to see is 
when you have access to pretty much any piece of information and now synthesis of that information that's really meaningful mm. with AI, you're going to be left with, you know, you, you offload this cognitive ability you used to use, your human calculator, right? You offloaded it now. You're going to offload that's it. That's a good way of putting it, a human calculator. Human calculator. You're offloading this yeah, ability okay. to, to synthesize information and, and generate information. Yeah. And so what's left? Well, what drives the brain, arguably, right? And when you have, you know, when you're well fed and well, you've slept, what drives the brain? It's meaning, story. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking down, these people looking down and, you know, so it's, it's, they're looking for meaning, right? They are generating their meaning through the stories they're receiving online, mm -hmm. right? Through their mm -hmm. platforms. So the human brain has 12 hierarchical cortical structures, you know, including the prefrontal cortex, et cetera, that are yep. always delineating between what's not a story and what's a story. Right. It's and equally generating a story based on the environment, what they receive. If they're non-proactive about the stories that are incoming. Mm. Right? So their, their environment determines their, their behavior to the stories they receive about the environment. Um, for example, I get I get my wallet stolen, therefore this place in town is very bad, and specifically this race is really bad. That's a very awful example of how to do this wrong. Mm. So the environment is generating the story if you're not proactive, right? mm. but so all that power, all that, you know, meaning searching and story acquiring is now here, right? And that process of, of, of generating that story that you used to be very vigilant about the human being and, and finding a story through, through um, meaning and purpose and spiritual awakening, et cetera. Well, that's here now, right? Yeah. So what's left? What's left? is all the computational things that we used to work really hard on, it's going to be uh, challenged. In, in, in a sense, you don't have to try this hard anymore to acquire meaning, theoretically, right? Mm. That's the interesting part for me. Very interesting. <clears throat> but I like what, in, in what you're saying though, you can't replace you. So when you're speaking to story and the context of content, the reason content actually sticks is not because of the knowledge itself. People can read over that. But if I've got a story that I can connect with, relate with on an emotional level, I'm going to remember that content way better than if it was just something that was knowledge-based. Now, now, so to your point, and, and let me just double down, what mm -hmm. happens when you acquire meaning and purpose? Well, you don't, it drives you to no do one something. Really doesn't acquire it until you take action upon. Exactly. It. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so we see throughout the history of religion, throughout the history of, of culture and and social, environmental, evolutionary biology, that it's until you take action that you've crystallized that information. Exactly. Practical application. So, and that yeah, so, so that's, I mean, it kind of highlights the need mm -hmm. for instructional designers and people who are content creators because you actually still got to craft a learning journey that's going to get somebody from point A when they enter into reading your content, absorbing it, consuming it, to I've transitioned, I've changed, I've transformed, I've got new perspective output. It's not just knowledge. It's learning by doing, right? So that's where we're at. And that's mm -hmm. my final point I'd like to make here at the very least yeah. is that if I were to focus as a leader, if I were to focus as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, I will double down. And that's what I'm doing now more than ever mm -hmm. on the human experience. Mm -hmm. If you look at the entertainment industry as a proxy and you go to a parking lot of any Taylor Swift concert, you see 20,000 people who couldn't get into the concert singing all their, her songs while the concert's being performed. What does mm -hmm. that tell you? If this is the case, proxy litmus you can see that the appetite for human connection is extraordinarily abundant thereby mm -hmm. this is going to multiply 10x at the very least within the next five years therefore you can set your um, platform to educate online as the beginning proxy of our connection but you must double down with the human experience therefore oh, really intimate human experiences beyond conferences Absolutely. Yeah. So the more that you can make that in, create an in-person feel as much as you can, that human component, you can. Yeah. Go with. I love oh, yeah. It. So well put. I couldn't have done a better job to wrap it up myself. I, I really would love to give five minutes just to hand over to, I'm pretty sure some eager questions um, coming from our uh, participants if they're up for it. So feel free to turn off your mics, guys, and the time is yours. These are fantastic learnings. Thank you, Fernando. Sure thing. Thank you. If you're not comfortable speaking, you can also feel free to drop it into the chat and Nicholas or one of I will bring it up. 
Oh, uh, forget my intensity. I'm very passionate about this, so I won't. Oh, no, it's fantastic. <laughs> Fernando and I realized we could talk about this subject all day. It's it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's it's exciting when I hear it. it doesn't make me scared about oh I'm gonna we're gonna lose our jobs if we're if we educators or creators or, we, or any of this field if anything it just highlights um, the incredible best practices that many of us are already applying. Yeah, with the caveat, right? Like, look, the reality is um, there's certain industries that are gonna be wiped out um, a- immediately. Yeah. Right? Uh, so look, we can't the the you know you can bury your head in the sand or pick up an ax and, and a shovel, pickaxe and a shovel, right? Is uh, start digging. Like the reality is there's certain things that are just a knowledge-based economy is is um, it's going to have take a huge hit. And then you're going to see equally, um, you know, look at, every, look at where professors are going to sit. Just, you know, the, the, the oracles of the planet for the Western world, right? Is they're equally as challenged. Because right? their whole industry is based on knowledge and the synthesis of that knowledge um, and the personality they use to deliver that knowledge to their so students. Here's the thing, and I don't want to give away from the session they're about to run um, in one of the breakout sessions, but there's a real difference between covering material and here's the knowledge that I can go blah, 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 but you could also access it yourself versus my role really as a content creator is to cause you to do something in some way, shape, or form. So in the essence... I'm, my job is not to cover the material, it's to cause you to learn, to eagerly go after you, chase after you, knowing that you've got different learner types, different, you, uh, Captain Moore just said it um, in our session before, we all learn at different speeds, different paces, we all connect with different emotional experiences. So me understanding and anticipating your needs better is going to craft a learning experience that actually, uh, it, it doesn't matter, AI will help to leverage that, but it cannot replace what we do. Absolutely. I. I... I agree with that 100%. It's it's up to you. Um, the information is public. Mm. The reality is, their industries are going to evolve, mm-hmm. and you know, knowledge based economy is going to have to rethink its its title. Mm. But equally, it's it's. Um, I think as we gear towards the human uh, mm. mm-hmm. human side, uh, we're going to see ourselves strengthened and uh, more efficiently used what uh, synthetic intelligence is more effective at doing, which is gathering data, synthesizing those data points, right? Synthesizing, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. then creating a starting point today on that data mm-hmm. and how to take action on it. Um, so it's the best research tool out there right now. So good, amazing. Um, do you have a success story to share? Well, we've been using AI for a very long time. Uh, so 2003 was um, maybe the next, the uh, AutoTune is the first kind of algorithmic tool musicians have been using. Uh, we generate our content with AI. I, I now, like instead of having, you know, four red cameras on, on one of our interviews in my studios, we just now use like three Sony cameras or four Sony cameras with no mics, internal mics, because it's, we synth, um, use AI and derivatives, AI uh, plugins, and it just sound incredible. It sounds like you have a really high end microphone, uh, mm-hmm. and then the video editing is done through AI. Um, so we we have been using AI since the first tools came out publicly and privately. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is probably this is nothing to do with content creation, but but, but kind of is. I'm curious. Can a person tell the difference between a like a AI manufactured piece of music versus something that was organically kind of recorded? That's a great question. I, I answered this question effectively earlier, and and so essentially. Yes and no. Why you sh- why I highly recommend to learn creativity, its nuances, and ha- be more creative, pick up an instrument, learn how to draw, paint, read more Hume or uh, Schopenhauer. Um, it is because the more you train the sensitivity to feel, the mm-hmm. more you start to feel what it feels real to you or not. Because that's all we have right now. That's and it sounds true. archaic, but it's true, right? Yeah. When you see a an image of a um an artist that's self-generated a video, right? And it has a perfect symmetry. It's the way the eye twitches or the face just shifts in a weird yeah. way. That like what I'm doing now, it's just not quite human. Yes. And you yeah. only can pick up on the subtleties at this very moment by how sensitive you are. That's what I say, creative. Um, wow. The creators have been, the value proposition as commodity makers for platforms and throughout the history of time have been completely wrong. The value proposition of the creative is that the next generation leaders 
people just don't know it yet. Hmm. That's why I work with world leaders specifically is to showcase that uh, there's a lot we can learn from the creative class and you're undervaluing the creative class because they're going to be your oracles for the future. Oh, so true. It's so true. They could teach us so much. It's really interesting actually when you, I don't know about you, when I hear a song and I hear the imperfection sometimes, it will make me remember the song in a really lasting way and I'll emotionally connect with it because it's not perfect. I'm like, oh, that could be me too. I can achieve that thing. Phenomenal, Nicola. It's a great <laughs> um, metaphor, right? So so yeah. there's, I, I had um in my studios, I have just equal, easily one of the world's best, if not the best, a monitoring system in which we listen to our music. We're like, uh, they're fine instruments and they're made out of wood and they're mm. massive. They're like, um, uh, like uh, um, about 16 feet high and maybe um, uh, six foot wide towers of speakers, right? And then we have like just, it's monumental. The reason I say that is because it's, it's a company, um, so I have the founder here yesterday, tuning, it means uh, making it sound per- like great. And and, he, and we were talking about it and his philosophy on design. And well, I don't use any plastic components. They're, it's all wood. It's all living, living and breathing. So wood yeah. expands and compresses. That's why he sound the most um, pleasing to the ear. It's these imperfections of yeah. wood expanding and compressing like a guitar that makes it so pleasing to the ear because it's different every time you listen to it. It's not the same condition of that wood, right? The reason why the ocean is so pleasing to the human ear is because it's never the same ocean wave that's coming through. Oh, wow. It's the asymmetries of randomness that Same make it thing. human and humanly pleasing. That's what I mean I by love us it. being unique. Which tells me, you're not passionate about this at all, I can tell, by the way, um, which, which tells me that when I'm creating content, I need to bring myself fully to that content. I think a lot yeah. of us as content creators are like, oh, yeah. content's here, here's my thing that I've created and I'm devoid from that. But actually, if you are vulnerable, because many of us don't like actually content creators, some of us don't actually like having our faces on camera. But that that emotional connection to the person who is speaking, producing content, actually, I I if I can connect with emotional rapport in some way, shape, or form, or oh, you're vulnerable, or oh, you're a little bit insecure, I'm connected to that, and I actually want yeah. to buy into what you've got to say, right? So that would be the the the, the, the flip side example of that. That's you know the instinct is to base trust on on the flawed, openly flawed yeah. human, right? Isn't so that interesting. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it kind of all coincides with what, again back to this point. What makes us human? What mm-hmm. I see a question: Would Bach be? Uh, would he use AI if it was available during his time? Well, mm-hmm. and would he still be successful and externally recognized as, as one of the most prolific human savants that have existed? Well, and he's just a savant. the last question. Sorry, just to wrap up. He's, he's a savant, so yeah. Essentially, he would be. Um, I think what would have changed is access. It would be the, he would have produced more content because it would have freed him up for, from the the basic stuff to to go deeper. The grunt work, yeah. Interesting. So good. Great answer. I We could probably hear from you all day. I, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank to you. Just your learnings for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'll hand it over to Megan because she can redirect you as to where everybody heads next. But thank you so very, very much for your time, Fernando. Appreciate you a lot.